very good morning to you. Before we get started on the local elections and what uh, the leader is going to tell you all about uh, tempering expectations, uh, I want to talk to you about the uh, protests at the weekend. Um, does it look like peaceful protest is being outlawed in this country? Well, I hope not, and I don't think that was the story of the weekend, actually. This was an enormously complex um, policing operation. We had heads of state flying in from all over the world um, and lots of members of the public out on the streets of London, including lots of protesters who were protesting peacefully, and most of that went off without a hitch. I think the Met clearly got it wrong in the case of these six protesters. I think the Mayor of London is right to say that we need to understand more about why that happened, whether it was caused by legislation or whether there were operational issues. The right to protest is an important part of British democracy and I think it's right that the Met has accepted that they got it wrong in this case. What we seem to have is sort of preemptive arrests. People haven't actually done anything wrong but are arrested just in case. And that's because of this new bill. It's something you campaigned against at the time. Is it something you would repeal if you got into office? Well, I don't think we know in this case what, why this happened. One of the outstanding questions that the Mayor of London is seeking answers to is why these protesters in particular were in contact with the Metropolitan Police in advance. The Metropolitan Police were aware of their plans and yet they were still arrested. So there may be other issues going on there. But there is a particular issue with the piece of legislation that was used that we warned about at the time. This is a piece of... This is a law that is essentially aimed at preventing people from locking or bolting mm. on to various things, whether it's railings or vehicles, where they can cause an obstruction. That's something that, of course, needs to be tackled. But the problem with the law as it's currently drawn, as we warned, is that it potentially pulls in people who aren't planning to... Uh, to, to bolt on, lock mm. on to, to, to things, people who aren't even planning to protest at all. It potentially draws them into the orbit it? of action. Would you redraw well, that legislation? Well, we'll look at, we'll look at the, the answers that are provided to the Mayor of London, as he's requested, to learn the lessons from this case. And where there are issues with the particular piece of legislation, our Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, has been absolutely clear that we will revisit that in government and make sure that we've got sensible, proportionate legislation that not only protects the public right to protest, but also protects the police, because at the moment, a great deal of the problems that the police have is that when you've got these very widely drawn powers, they're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't, and we want to make sure that we get that right. Let's turn to the, um, the local elections and the Shadow Cabinet meeting today. Keir Starmer saying the hardest part lies ahead. It was a bad result for the Conservatives. Uh, I think it's acknowledged it was a good result for Labour, but not a great result. It wasn't a result which would get Labour a majority in the House of Commons. But Keir Starmer says, interestingly, he says, people who turned away from us during the Corbyn years and the Brexit years are coming back. And he's saying that to the Shadow Cabinet today, to say that the Corbyn years and the Brexit years are all in the past. I wonder, is part of the challenge for you that people are still remembering the Corbyn years and the Brexit years? I think there's a bigger challenge, actually, a new challenge. I think we've done quite a good job over the last few years of per persuading people to look at us again. We've shown that we can sort our party out, that we're fit to govern, that we've dealt with issues like anti-Semitism and the collapse of trust that people had in us as a consequence. But in the intervening years, we've had Boris Johnson, we've had Liz Truss. I think people have started to lose faith in politics as a lever for change in their lives. And especially at a time when we've got a cost of living crisis, public services on their knees. People are looking to Labour and saying, have you really got the answers to the challenges that the country faces? We've shown that we do when it comes to the National Health Service, abolishing non-DOM tax status and getting more doctors and nurses into our NHS. We're laying out plans on affordable housing and other ways to help people with the cost of living crisis. But that's why Keir is right to say we've got more work to do because we had a mountain to climb in 2019 and the circumstances that the Conservatives have created have made have made that that much harder for people to trust their politicians. And we've got to restore that faith. Of course, part of the, the, the challenge for Sir Keir is that he was a member of the Shadow Cabinet under Jeremy Corbyn and he was campaigning for a second referendum um, to return to the European Union. He pledged, when he became leader 
to return to free movement, to nationalise uh, electricity, gas and water, to abolish tuition fees. It's part of the challenge for him that for him moving on from the Corbyn and the Brexit years is rather harder than for you and for some other members of the Shadow Cabinet. Well, look, in fairness to him, a lot of people were campaigning for a second referendum at the time and there was a very live debate going on in this country. The country was split down the middle and politicians reflected that. I think he did the brave and hard thing after the 2019 election by accepting that this country needs to move on. That is the most pressing priority for most people. We can't keep rehashing old arguments. We've got to look to the future. You know, if you'd asked me six months ago about Labour plans that Labour was trying to develop around housing, they might have looked very different in a scenario in which we hadn't had a Liz Trust government where the Conservatives crashed the economy and added an average of £500 onto people's monthly mortgage payments for years and years to come. That changes the landscape. It changes what can be done. It changes the solutions that are needed. And we will relentlessly adapt. We'll level with the public. We'll be honest with the public. Our values are not up for grabs. They're not up for sale. But we're going to have to find new ways to apply those values and to solve this country's problems in the context that we inherit from the Tories, um, which is going to be very dire indeed. In our uh, poll, Servation poll for Good Morning Britain, ahead of the local election, Starmer was failing to personally inspire voters um, and was just one point ahead of Rishi Sunak. And, uh, you know, Ed's already mentioned a couple of the policies that he's turned 180 on. Second referendum, for instance, the pledge to scrap tuition fees, a common ownership of rail, mail, energy and water, increasing income tax for the 5% of top earners. I wonder if part of your problem, Lisa and Andy, is the voters don't know what Sir Keir Starmer stands for. I think they're getting to know him and I think that that process has been ongoing since 2019 when he won the leadership contest. I think they're starting to see a, a politician who is relentlessly focused on the country. He had to sort out the problems in the Labour Party and he's done that and he was right to focus on doing that first. But he's interested in the country, he's interested in how we come up with the long-term solutions that fix this country's problems, not just sticking plasters. We will, of course, provide help to people immediately through things like the windfall tax to help people with the cost of energy. But there are long-term solutions that this country needs. And I think people are starting to see that and know that about Keir. I think one of the things they like about him is the fact that he's prepared to be pragmatic. We're not going into an election making promises that we know we can't keep. And if you can't meet the cost of the tuition fees policy, it's people's money. They don't have a lot of it. We should level with people in advance of an election about that, not do what the coalition government did, say that they can do it and then drop that pledge quietly later. We're going to be honest with people about what is possible, oh, okay. but we're not going to let that limit our ambitions. And, right. of, and, of course, you're aiming for majority, but if it's a hung parliament, you've said no coalition with the SNP, the Scottish Nationalists. Mm -hmm. Could there be a coalition with the Liberal Democrats? We're, we're not aiming for a coalition no, but with if anybody. There was one. But, but if there the was only one. partnership we're interested in is with the British people. We think that these results this week show that we're on the right path. Like Keir is going to say to the Shadow Cabinet today, there is more to do. The hardest part lies ahead of us. But we're confident that come the next general election, people will be faced with a very clear choice, more of the same with the Conservatives or change with Labour. And over the next few months, we're going to be fighting every single day to show that we're not just an opposition to this Tory government, but a genuine alternative. All right. OK, listen, Andy, thanks very much Thank indeed. you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, they're going to have to work out how to sell that change with the Labour government without conceding that Sir Keir Starmer does seem to keep changing his mind on certain policies. You just have to explain it really clearly, what it was then and what it is now. Mm. We had a pandemic in between, but you can't brush it away. You have to take it head on. Yeah.